Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Gotham City. I'm your host, Levi Rosman. This is a podcast where I talk to people who live in the chess world on the 64 squares, but also at times beyond them. In this episode, we are staying within the chess world, and we are speaking with Polish Grandmaster Wojciech Miranda. Wojciech is educated to actually be a lawyer, but he has a consistent rating of 2600 across, I think, all three time controls. He has many notable victories in his career, and he was my chess coach in 2019, before all the chess boom, and now recently in 2022, and who knows, maybe once again in the future. He's also a husband, a father, and a published author of the book Universal Chess Training, and a potential another one in the future. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Wojciech, thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Frank. Thank you for the invitation. Um, okay, I, I, there was, I'm still debating. You know, it's kind of like me selecting which opening to play before my game in the, in the, in the tournament, like 30 minutes beforehand or even at the board. I'm still debating which topic to start with because you just came back from Olympiad. It's a good topic of conversation, but you also have a special... Uh, there's a, the difference between the guest here today in that you are the only chess coach I've ever had. So I, which topic do you want to start with? Because I feel like they're both very interesting. You either get to make fun of me or we get to talk about uh, <laughs> Olympiad. Yeah, I mean, we do have so much to talk about, actually, because, uh, you know, we did cooperate with each other, as far as I can tell, back in 2019, a little bit, for a couple of months, and then we kind of returned return to each other, you know, recently, also for a couple of months again, uh, and, uh, yeah, both of those topics are very interesting, in my opinion, uh, the, the former one, the Olympia being, at least for me, a little bit more painful because of my abysmal performance, you know, and uh, so maybe let's start with you, right, maybe let's start with your, uh, with our joint adventure, you know, as a coach, as a as a coach and a, and, a, and, a, and a pupil student, right? And uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, this was one of my favorite, you know, coaching adventures, to be honest. Yeah, one Why? of the first one also. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there are multiple reasons for that. Yeah, first of all, you were one of my first students, uh, you know, uh, since when I became like a professional coach of something like this, yeah? because uh, it's all happened around 2018, 2019, when I was leaving the corporate space, I decided that I'm going to devote my life to chess from that point on, you know, which was obviously like a very controversial decision to at least, you know, like my closest family, but not for me anymore, right, because I was like, like totally convinced that this is what I want to continue doing in life, yeah, and then Thanks to, uh, you know, my other kind of adventure with the New York Marshals, the Marshall Chess Club, we got to know each other. And this is how we started out, right? And uh, also our training sessions, at least from my perspective, were also always like uh, super interesting, super kind of, um, yeah, I always felt kind of uh, like the flow, you know, when we were training together. And I also feel... Uh, you know, like also from the perspective of years that we, that I, I was also the one who profited, who, who benefited from that immensely, you know, as, as a coach and as a player, because I felt that, you know, the flow of ideas was, you know, going in both directions back then. You know? Wow, that's uh, super humbling. Or you're just being very nice. That, that's also another. But if you're, if you're serious, then um, admittedly, I was also probably a better chess player three years ago. Uh, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. I think that back then you were... I mean, I don't know whether I can say this publicly because there is this, you know, like coach, coach student relationship in this confidentiality clause stuff, you know, secrecy, etc. So if you ever feel that I'm saying too much, please stop me. Yeah? Okay. Please stop me. So what I wanted to say is that back then, uh, you were at least in my eyes, you know, like a very high, like a hyper aggressive player, right? So uh, I would say that nobody needed to ask you twice to attack. Yeah. Very often, however, you know, there was this kind of. Um, cognitive kind of dissonance that I saw in your games in the sense that you know you are very you know you are very aggressive you like to attack very much on the other hand your openings were not always aligned you know with this kind of attitude right back that but later you know like in two in 2022 you became more sustainable right you uh, not only adopted new openings new ideas but it's also that uh, you know, you learned how to, you know, like constructively stand still and actually, you know, make sure that maybe the opponent is going to start making some mistakes from which you can, you know, directly benefit, right? And this appealed me to me, it appealed to me a little bit uh, more on the one hand. On the other hand, I wouldn't have said that you were a stronger player uh, back then. To me, both in 2019 and 20, as well as 2022, in my opinion, you'd need like two years of hard work to become 
to become a GM, right? And this is, you know, like a statement that I, uh, I wholeheart wholeheartedly sustain, you know? Um, it did therefore kind of uh, make me a little bit sad when he announced that he'd be retiring from prof professional chess. Then again, I feel as if it was, you know, just uh, that it, as if you just needed a little bit of time maybe to think some things through. I do understand your reasons also. I did listen to your, um, your uh, video back then twice, yeah, because I wanted to make sure that I fully understand your uh, your kind of motifs. And as much as I was sad as a coach, I said to myself also that I do understand because uh, uh, chess is like a very, very competitive sport and it does take its toll on one's mental health, on one's kind of, uh, you know, even on, on the everyday life, I would say, when you think about it, right? Yeah, I definitely suffer from things like when I'm sitting in a bad position, I start evaluating every decision I've ever made, not just the ones in the game itself. You don't, you don't go through that. Like if you're playing a game and it's going poorly and uh, you, you don't start thinking about anything else, like, oh my God, I gotta, you know, I gotta do this better. But it has nothing to do with chess. You know. Maybe not so much, but there are moments when I literally want to vanish from the surface of, of the earth, you know, out of shame, you know, of, because of what the mistakes that I did at the board. Yeah? So I, uh, recently I had this game uh, at the Olympia against Tiger Hiller Person, a very renowned theoretician, very strong player from Sweden. And, you know, like out of the opening, I managed to outsmart him. I set, you know, like a tiny little, little uh, funny trap out there. He fell into it, luckily. And you know, if you if you look at this uh, this game afterwards from the perspective of you know like a third party observer, you'd say White went nuts afterwards. He obtained like a plus three kind of position. Then you know he allowed Black to equalize, and at the end he misplayed an equal end game and you know blundered and lost it eventually, like a like a tragedy in the making, I would say. Uh, but then again, you know, like when you are actually playing the game and you are thinking about your ideas, what to do, and you know that you and you do understand that you see some ideas which might be winning at the end of the day, but you're not completely sure. This leads to one mistake, one inaccuracy. Then you want to save what is still savable. Then you go for a draw. Then you, st then you start thinking maybe about winning the game again. And then you make things even worse. And then when you're completely upset with your performance, then all of a sudden uh, you blunder in, a, in what seemed to be like an absolutely drawn end game, uh, like a type of an end game that you know, like grandmasters tend to eat for breakfast, literally. It's, it's so easy. Huh? And you make like a mistake, you commit a mistake. Imagine you commit a mistake at the very last moment when the mistake can be uh, committed. Yeah, literally, I wanted to like not only just vanish, just give up and vanish. Yeah, literally vanish. You know, just not just for people not to see me anymore. So this is obviously a psychological burden. Uh, winning is easy. Losing is not so easy anymore. I would say. Uh, however, uh, we have you know like at least nine games per tournament like that. Yeah, and uh, we need to learn how to cope with the stress. We need to learn how to cope with the failures. And not not not, not many people talk about this. I would say there's this kind of, um, you know, everybody is excited about winning streaks, everybody's excited about winners, and nobody talks about, you know, like people who lose, for example, and uh, they have to deal with it afterwards. Yeah? yeah, one of the most impressive mindsets, whether it's legitimate or he just is extremely good at putting on this sort of act deliberately, uh, whenever I spoke to Anish Giri, even some of the losses that I observed hurt me to watch and he would just be super chill. For example, in the, the last Tata Steel, I think he lost the playoff to Jordan. Uh, and he had, he's, he's had others, and he will do an interview right after. I've, and he's just super calm. Like maybe afterward he throws something against the wall, but even, even then I don't think so. I really think he just is a good loser. And it's extremely impressive because a, a, a blitz game could ruin my day, which like... Yeah, you know what, I think that, uh, you know, like one needs to understand that losing is like an inherent element of the game, right? And uh, I'm gonna go even one step further beyond. I'm gonna say that, uh, you know, like there is no winning without losing. Yeah, and uh, people tend to forget about it very often. For example, I remember having this training session with a very talented youngster back in the days and uh, he clearly had problems with, uh, with you know, like coping with losses. You know, he would actually start crying every single time uh, he, he lost, or maybe he would be even starting to cry when they, the position was already getting worse. And obviously wow. this doesn't affect 
uh, you know, like the mental stamina of yours too, too well, you know, if you start crying during the game. So I wanted to kind of cheer him a little bit. I wanted to kind of teach him this kind of attitude that, you know, you, you have to lose from time to time because thanks to losses, you become stronger. And so I wanted to ask him, like, how do you think? How many games have I lost during my lifetime, you know, as a player? And, you know, I expected, you know, his answer to be something like, yeah, you know, maybe a couple of thousand. And then we would say, yeah, so you see it's normal to lose and you can still become a grandmaster. So he instead started counting on his little fingers and he's like, five? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, 5,000 at the very least, yeah. Uh, but then again, you know, this is all because of, uh, you know, like how people, you know, how the wider chess audience cherishes the people who win and actually they do scold and they to do kind of a, sometimes even denigrate the losers. You know, everybody is smart nowadays if they are armed with an engine and with an engine, every single blunder looks ultra easy and, uh, you know, like totally easy to have been avoided. Yeah. Whereas at the board, all sorts of uh, you know emotions uh, you know actually play a role as well. Uh, you can be you know like the best expert on end games in the world, for example, but you're still going to be prone to making some mistakes you know from time to time. Uh, let's take for example uh, this kind of situation with um, involving Samuel Shankland you know, uh, at the Tata Steel tournament a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. where, where, he, where he gave up in an essentially drawn end game right you know this was like some kind of fortress like position with a bad so-called bad bishop and you know like the internet went wild literally went wild yeah and i was like yeah obviously he shouldn't have but then again well he's human he's blood and bone yeah he's but he's a super strong grandmaster but everybody every human is capable sadly of making such a mistake he needs to get over it you know and you know keep on training because he deserves you know to be done even some maybe 2750 rated or more yeah this happens to people but the internet was really mean really cruel uh how about how about this time around I mean, remember what uh, the game against Hafanisyan, how he thought he was going to, I mean, that was uh, just, I, I think Sam is being tested by God. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I had this kind of idea too. I thought about it like that, exactly. Uh, I mean, touching the wrong piece is not a thing that happens, you know, like very often to a professional player on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, when you think about it, you're, you're imagine yourself playing like five hours straight. And before the round, you've been preparing for three hours straight. Yeah? So you're kind of exhausted already. Let's put it, let's be honest about this, right? And then, you know, you make like something that they call like a finger failure. Yeah? You kind of uh, touch the wrong piece. And, you know, like cruelly enough, this, this kind of piece, every single move with this kind of piece loses in what was essentially a drawn end game. Yeah. So uh, definitely uh, some people would laugh about it, but I'd say, I, I put it differently. I'd say, yeah, uh, it could have happened because of fate. It could have happened because like of a momentary lack of concentration. And I would be the last person to ever condemn him for for doing that. Yeah. So it happens to the best of us, but you know what happened next? He got benched for like, Two, two rounds at the same, you know, like yeah. in a row. So this was a little bit mean also. Um, you know, I had, you know, similar uh, stories uh, also, you know, in my in my life also at the Olympia. For example, I lost, uh, that's that's aforementioned game to Hillard person. And what did my team do? My team was, well, they, they didn't scold me for a second. They were like, we're with you. We're with you. It happens to the best. No worries. You're still like a member, you know, like a, like an iron, we would we call like an iron member of the of the national team, and we, we do not want to. Uh, we want to make sure that you do not have any stupid faults, you know. After this, it was obviously an accident happened to the best of us, yeah. And it was a very nice of them, even if I do know, uh, understand like subconsciously that I deserved all the worst, all the worst kind of comments that could happen. Yeah? Uh, then again, you see that's also like a difference between you know like a loser and a champion that you know like that people do not give up after such mishaps, after such setbacks, right? So I'm actually a huge fan personally of Samuel Shankland. I do not know him personally. On on the other hand, I've been, you know, like a long-term admirer of his games, and I'm pretty sure that he's capable of becoming even stronger, much stronger than he is right now, despite those, you know, little mishaps from time to time. Which I, I just going back to something that you said. Uh, you said when we started uh, working together for the first time in 2019, you were only a few years into being a full-time chess professional, like playing, teaching. You, 
what were you doing for the years before that? I know you're you're educated to be like uh, the, you went through law school. Is that the same system in Poland as it is in uh, in the U.S.? Like you have to go through a specialized school besides college or graduate program. So how long were you? You were a lawyer by practice for how long? Like what were you doing? Uh, so so it's like this. Basically, uh, since when I was a kid, I knew that you know chess is like an addition to life, a very nice one, a very satisfying one. Then again, it's just, you know, like one of the many things that I'm going to be doing in life. Yeah. So my uh, my parents, you know, like they always um, try to instill upon me this kind of a, of an attitude that, you know, like education is most important because no matter who you are, if you are educated, basically you're going to handle it in life. You're going to be able to kind of, uh, you know, become somebody basically, right? Earn a living, let's put it like this. So, uh, you know, when, when I was, uh, you know, 20 years of age, I became a GM. I was like 2580, 2590 rated, but I went into law school basically, right? And obviously, because of this, my chess career, my chess development is such a good stall for a while. You know? um, after I finished law school, I became, you know, like I worked as a trainee attorney for like three, four years. Then I eventually, you know, like uh, passed my bar exam and I started working you know, like at, a, at the law office, basically a law, law firm. And then I moved to like one of the biggest Swiss banks that there are. I worked in compliance and then afterwards I worked with uh, funds. Yeah. Then again, you know, there was always this kind of, you know, like chess haunted me in a positive way, like always. You know, if, you, if you're relatively good at something and you like it, um, you know, you kind of uh, have this kind of feeling that you want to keep on doing something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, working in, in the funds industry and at the same time, you know, like doing something so absorbing as chess, basically, uh, you couldn't, it, those things, they cannot be done simultaneously. So one day I woke, simply woke up in the morning and I said to myself, despite the fact that I'm so privileged, you know, that I have a nice education, that I have a very nice job, that I have a very good work, uh, work relationships at my current job, I feel miserable and I need to do something about it. It took a little bit of time to uh, convince my, uh, my family, you know, my next of kin basically that uh, that this is a good idea, you know, to start, you know, like a, like a teaching business, start playing chess, you know, chess tournaments again from a new, yeah, and uh, earn a living based on that, because you need to know that in Poland, back then, especially before the pandemic kicked in, right, basically, um, you know, like uh, internet, I don't know, running like a YouTube channel, for example, or, or being like a freelancer, wasn't associated with, at least not with financial success, right, so... Sure. This is kind of a funny story because, uh, you know, my closest family were actually like huge opponents of this kind of change, especially as my first child, my daughter was supposed to be born, you know, in 2018. Uh, but I was waiting for a pretext, you know, and then, you know, so I was just complaining, continuously complaining how miserable I am, etc. Then all of a sudden, my, uh, my mother-in-law suddenly mentioned, okay, if you're so miserable, maybe you can give it a try. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. And what I did the very next day, I went to the municipality, I opened my business, I opened my bank accounts for the business and started you know from this point on uh, and I've never, never been happy actually. never been happier uh, another funny story you know because you know when you think about being a freelancer it's like uh, in Poland at least this is associated with a constant lack of money basically that it's sure. like a good economy basically right uh, then again you know when my mother asked me okay how have you been doing throughout those last two months and Probably she expected to hear that, you know, that I'm doing miserably and I'm considering coming back to my previous job. I said, okay, I earned this and that, but I'm still waiting for the bonuses. And this changed immediately. She was like, okay, so why didn't you do it early, earlier? <laughs> <Mania?"> <laughs> no, it's I not. I, I didn't want to, uh, you know, like uh, create this kind of impression that, you know, being a chess coach is so profitable. I just say that, especially nowadays, uh, you know, in the reality that we are living right now, especially after COVID, uh, one doesn't need to do a day job, you know, from nine to five and, uh, and you know, spend his days, you know, kind of, a, as they say in my country, to shuffle the papers from one side of the table to the other, basically. Mm -hmm. But you can also do something very creative, something that makes other people happy 
and helps them feel fulfilled, you know, as yeah, in this case, as chess players, yeah. And except for being super satisfied for you, what you do, you can also earn a very, very decent living based on that. Yeah, I went through a kind of a similar thing. I don't know how much we ever discussed this when when we did uh, did work together, but I I got into college. I was uh, nowhere near GM strength. I think I was actually still rated twenty two hundred feet when I was nineteen, which probably looking back is a bit of a travesty. I probably should have at least been a title player uh, with 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 the I think the raw talent that I had growing up. But I I, I grew up in a place without much chess and without much um neither one of my parents really kind of forced me to study so whenever i wanted to quit whenever i didn't want to study i just didn't i was a very individualistic uh child it was very difficult to convince me to do anything uh, and i got into college and i went into a college here in new york which was very cheap which is not a concept in poland right it's just college or it's just law school um, but here if you stay in the city, you either get a full scholarship, which is what I did, or you pay, you know, $5,000, which is probably crazy in Europe, but 5000 is super cheap. My alternative was going to another school where I would be paying $60,000 a year, $60,000 a year for one year. Um, and I, you know, my family was super happy. They didn't, nobody, know, nobody knew what I wanted to do. So my first two years of college, I was 4.0 GPA. I was... Uh, you know, recruiting for banks and all, and all this stuff and going to all these. I was standing in a line of 20 people waiting to talk to this associate banker, you know, hi, I'm this person, this and that. And uh -huh. yeah, that stuff was super depressing for me too. I did some internships. I was going on this trajectory where your second year of college, you have to work at a small bank. Your junior year, you have to get the internship at the big bank and all this stuff. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I get you there, basically. I mean, uh, it's not that uh, doing like, at least, you know, like a lawyer career is, is depressing. It's like that you need to climb for the, from the bottom up, basically, right? And you're like junior lawyer, mm -hmm. and you get, you know, like then you get to then you ascend to a lawyer, right? And then you stay as a lawyer for like five years, and it kind of uh, feels like ages, basically. Whereas the chess part, you know, at least in my situation, already back then as a GM, uh, it resembled uh, instant, instantaneous gratification, I would say. Yeah? So I can just start doing that and I'm going to earn a pretty penny, basically. So this was also one of, the, one of the reasons. But there's another kind of thing, you know, like people didn't mention it so much. If you do a day job and uh, you do like a, you do nine to five, for example, typically nine to five is like the least of punishments, I would say. People start, you know, if they're ambitious, they start doing, you know, eight to six, you know, like seven to seven, to, seven, to seven for example, sometimes if, you know, like there's the need for overtime on a given day. And, uh, you know, like the, what's the direct result that, you know, like the familiar relationships, they do tend to deteriorate over time a little bit. Yeah. And now by comparison, imagine that you work from home and you see your children grow up, basically, for example, you know, like, like the biggest advantages of my work for the time being is that I can literally get up at 7 a.m. You know, every single day, walk my daughter to to preschool. You know, we can have a fun chat along the way. You know, we can talk about her her girlfriends basically at the preschool. Then I can pick her up. This is actually what I'm going to do once we once we finish our nice conversation, right? And you know, we can go for for a lot for a walk. And and, and all this is unimaginable un unimaginable if you do like a corporate job. At least not without you know her taking its toll on you know like the paycheck that you get. Yeah, whereas if you're like a coach, if you are like the uh, lord of your own time, as they, as they say in my country, basically you can arrange things in a way that, you know, you have the time for everything. And at the same time, the money, at the, uh, uh, you know, on the account at the end of the day is still okay. Yeah? So this is like a huge kind of advantage of, of being an entrepreneur on one hand. And on the other hand, you know, in my specific case, a, co a coach. Yeah? What, uh, what's the average price of law school in Poland? Well, education is basically uh, universally free. There are some kind of fees that you need to pay, uh, like registration fee, etc. You sometimes need to pay for, uh, like, uh, you know, student IDs, for example. Uh, but in total, if you want to become a student that's, you know, like a, like a national kind of, a, let's call it like a national university, mm -hmm. uh, like in Warsaw, for example, the, the University of Warsaw, let's take this kind of example, then it's essentially free. Obviously you need to pay for accommodation if you if you if you do not live in Warsaw, right? You need to cover all of your expenses like food, etc. la la la. Uh, but in general it's like for free. I think that you know like those 
uh, college tuition fees, you know, are a very American thing, a purely American thing. Wait, right? going to get a law degree is still free? Yeah, definitely. Oh my God. No, you have to understand, this sounds like an alien conversation. I mean, here, the, the whole badge of honor is that you are in debt because you owe your schools uh, $200,000 and you, I mean, obviously the salary is different, right? So I think out of law school to work at a big corporate law firm, base salary is like $200,000 a year, which mm -hmm. is in amazing. That's an incredible nice. salary. That's right? okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that's, di that's significantly higher than w w what it would be in, in, in parts of Europe, you know, Poland specifically, but you also owe quarter million dollars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I think that being, being debt free is actually a very nice feeling to have that you go to sleep and uh, you do not even think about, you know, like the next installment that you need to pay. Yeah? So I cannot imagine myself paying like 50, wow. 50 grand, you know, per year just to get a degree. Uh, especially in my situation, you know, with the benefit of hindsight that I now know that I'm not, not working in the industry anymore. Uh, this would sound like particularly hilarious if I did something like that. Uh, then again, you know, like Europe and the US, you know, at least judging by like all the conversations that I had from, you know, with my US students, two different worlds. Yeah, when it goes for education, when it goes for healthcare in particular, I'd say. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you if you go to Ivy League to an Ivy League uh, university and you study law, you get a degree. Um, the tuition fee uh, they, it does kind of cover you know some kind of um, services that you wouldn't get from a national you know, university here here in Poland, for example, or France, maybe in Germany. Mm -hmm. but the thing is that uh, you know is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? You know, like closer contact to professors. I don't know, being you know like. Uh, one of 50 people instead of one of uh, 200, for example, you know, on, uh, you know, on the year, right? Is it really worth it to be so indebted? Yeah? Obviously, those are two different worlds, and we could always argue whether you know the U.S. is better than the rest of the world. We we all know you know those die-hard fans of the U.S., but let's be honest, there are some things that shouldn't be like that. Yeah, especially those uh, college debt, the college debt stories. They are scary, at least from the perspective of the European. Yeah, that's what I was very interested in 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 asking um i and like i said i i, w I went through a very similar thing because I, I didn't know if i was going to be corporate or not my last two years of college not only did i start working chess full time i i, I stopped going to class basically <laughs> like, I, I, uh, advice for all young listeners and watchers of the podcast that was not good you should you know you should uh stick to your degree you should not skip out on classes i also I found it quite ridiculous that I went to a university where you were credited or not for attending classes. Like a class, if you have exams, that should be the grade that you get. You should not get any sort of partial grade if you don't show up. Like if you don't show up to 90% of classes but still pass exam, it means you, 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 know, you knew what you were doing. <laughs> yeah, but you're speaking about the perfect world and the world is not perfect, I guess. Yeah? So yeah. Poland is actually the same. Uh, you get credited for, you know, mostly you get credited, credited for presence. But then again, if you do not pass the final exam, you're going to, yeah, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to try again and eventually you're going to get yourself, I know what the word is, it exmatriculated, something like this, yeah, that you're going to yeah. be removed from the list of the students, right? So, uh, yeah, there are differences, but as you see, there are also similar similarities, I guess. Last question about uh, about all this coaching stuff. Do you, um, did you coach like young beginners or have you always coached strong students? Who, who's your strongest student? Or strongest uh, students. I don't know if that's something you publicly talk about. Well, the strongest student, the student whom I can reveal, yeah, whom I yeah. can reveal because this is you know like a well-known story. My strongest student, student whom I can reveal is uh, the chair guy. I don't know if you remember, uh, you know, the video that you posted. I mean, of course, yeah. <laughs> I also, I also thought that I thought this was the answer, but just because I know it doesn't mean you know I'm gonna share it. It's it's your information to disclose. Okay, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Pavel Teslov, yeah, let's, let's uh, say the full name. Uh, but uh, then again, you know, I do get a lot of inquiries from 2,650, 2,700 rated players who just want some, you know, temporary cooperation, right? So they say to me, oh, yeah, I've got this weakness and like, I'd like to use your help to have it removed. Yeah, so for example, somebody doesn't sense, uh, you know, those kind of critical moments in the game too well. And my job is then to, you know, like make sure that this is exactly the case. 
If so, then to um, you know select some very very uh, very kind of sophisticated tra and valuable training material, and you know kind of help him help, help him or her uh, out based on this. Yeah. So typically, once we come to the conclusion that he or she is already feeling feeling better in this respect, then we say till next time basically till until uh, you have you know another kind of training need. Some people just want opening. Some people uh, just, uh, you know, they want, you know, like a complete customized program. Yeah. But I always do emphasize that if you want to see results coming from, you know, a couple of, stemming from a cooperation with a coach, then definitely you need to, you know, like prepare for like uh, six months of hard work. That's for sure. Yeah, because you know, like only over a time span of six months, do certain you know like additional get, uh, weaknesses get revealed. Yeah, and we can actually try uh, to to have them removed. Yeah, but you know, like Pavel, Pavel is like the only kind of the best student of mine whom I can reveal for the time being, because typically there's always a confidentiality clause coming in our agreements. Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Uh, I remember once you sent me some opening files, uh, but you had kind of prefaced it by saying it was tailored for like a 2000, you know, 1900, 2000. And I, I, I strongly believe that the weaker you are in chess, okay, not weaker, but just the lower your rating is in chess, the more fun it is. Like the more, the more fun and interesting the game still is just because there's so much to learn. There's still so many avenues you can explore and there's so, you, you don't get punished the same way. You can really do whatever you want, it feels like, in some of the lower rating bands. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're not going to get punished by theory. You're not going to get punished by, um, you know, super uh, sk nuanced and skilled opponents that, that neutralize you. Also, there's a little bit less, like, theory monster kids. Like, the kids who are still 1800... It's good they're 1800 because there's kids <laughs> their age who are 2400. <laughs> well, it's a little bit complicated than that. I think that on the one hand, uh, you know, ignorance is bliss, they say, in the sense that uh, I do really miss the times when I would go to a game and I would just check, you know, like literally two, three lines, you know, and uh, uh, I wouldn't even know that I'm going to get myself surprised by something nasty. Yeah. And nowadays it's like different. You know, for example, at the Olympia, imagine getting like, three blocks in a row, and then you kind of, and then the next thing that is coming is the Berlin is what. Yeah, so uh, it's like, it's like kind of different. Uh, it's like very difficult, it, you know, the deeper you go, the, the, the more difficult it gets, obviously, but sometimes not knowing that there's like a refutation of your concept, or maybe uh, not knowing that there are problems uh, in obtaining an advantage in a given line is gonna, is gonna make you go into that line, enter it actually, and you're gonna work out the details because as they say, also, sometimes you just, uh, it's better not to know because if you know that something is not doable, you're not going to do it. If you do not know that something is doable, you're going to come and you're going to do it, actually. Yeah? There is this proverb uh, attributed to Newton. I don't know, probably to Newton. I'm not really sure about this, right? As, as it goes, however, for those, you know, 1800 rated kids, um, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, one of my students pointed out this uh, curious phenomenon of so-called COVID kids. I don't know if you ever heard about COVID kids. Uh, children who are like, imagine this, 1600 rated before COVID struck. And they're like, you know, the, afterwards their parents who are typically, you know, they were concerned with the virus, etc. They would say, okay, you're not going to school. You're going to be uh, homeschooled. And mm -hmm. apart from that, you can do whatever you like. So what did they do? They would like, train 10 hours per day and you know like after <laughs> after leaving you know after those two years they would be they were like literally chess jack i would say they would be so well prepared that you know later they're still 1800 rated but their opening preparations like 2400 level yeah or maybe they're much stronger than than you know than, than you'd say you know at first if you look at their game there's uh there's actually a streamer kid who uh who I've played recently and it's actually kind of insane um you have a lot of kids who are rated to, he's 2100 USCF his mm -hmm. blitz is 2800 he's beaten Hikaru and his okay. FIDE rating is like 1800 uh -uh. <laughs> I mean it's just insane like it, it, it's it's completely nuts um obviously I'm talking about uh you 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 may not know but I'm, I, I think I think those are his ratings uh, his account is Chess Brainiac, and yeah, he's uh, he. 
I have a little bit of an ongoing, you know, drama with him. He flagged me King Rook versus King Rook, you know, which is uh, <laughs> as uh, which Vladim- is an absolute no-no, by the way, on GM level. Um, it's like, it's yeah. like Vladimir Kramnik said, you know, he said, I'm not going to subject myself to this moral degradation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds even better with the Russian accent, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was an amazing, amazing uh, thing there where Vincent Keimer did, did this to, uh, to, to former world champion. Um, but yeah, he's just one of many examples. There's so many kids like this whose whose fide and everything has to catch up. Uh-huh. Um, have you seen there's like a phenomenon now of hybrid events? Have you seen this? Hybrid events? You mean Miami stuff, FTX Cup, crypto? No, 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 no. So I guess this is only really happening right now in 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 US. But th- there's um so fide allowed. <laughs> Uh, okay, I know, I know. P N W C C, right? Something like this. Yeah, so they organize the most of them, but I, I mean, maybe it's happening in other places. Um, and basically, it's like it, it, it's a cool, it's a cool theory and concept. It's basically you go to a place which is certified, where they have proctoring, they have, and you play online, okay. classical rated game against somebody else who is somewhere else in the world, also in a certified place, and it counts for your feeder rating, even though it's an online game. I mean, in yeah. theory, it sounds good. But I couldn't believe it, yeah? I mean, our common friend, Kyan Griffith, you know, told me about this, and I was like, no way, yeah? Yeah. And, you know, you'd be paired against people like who are simultaneously at the same time sitting in Bulgaria, for yeah. example, and it is FIDE rated, imagine that. Yeah, so yeah. obviously this leaves a little bit of room for abuse in the sense that, you know, the proctor might be, you know, like, uh, I'm not accusing obviously anybody of anything, but the proctor might be a person who wants to help out, you know, like the players a little bit, and he can kind of uh, turn a blind blind eye on some kind of events. But then again, I think that this is the future, you know, like back in 2019, when we were playing at the PCL, for example, the Proctors League, who would have thought that this would have, that this would become the new normal? You know, who would have thought? You know? yeah. Also, people, you know, the Miami FTX Cup that I mentioned, you have people traveling to Miami, you know, the best players in the world, traveling to Miami to uh, sit in front of computers, not in front of each other, and actually play against each other, you know, at one venue. Yeah, so yeah. This, this, you know, back then, this would sound like a, uh, yeah, like some kind of aberration to me. It's something like, you know, that it's like a, a futuristic kind of dystopia of chess. Yeah. <laughs> But now it's like a new normal. Yeah? So who knows? Maybe this is also the future of just who knows uh, what is going to happen over the next couple of years, judging by the, by the pace of events, you know, first COVID, then, you know, war in Ukraine, etc. Uh, I only wonder what's coming up next. Yeah, yeah me too. Um... It, uh, the, the hybrid thing is, uh, is, pretty, is pretty crazy. The, uh, yeah, going, flying a bunch of European guys to Miami just to have them still play on, on, on the computer is, it definitely feels weird if you're a, if you're a chess traditionalist, but obviously they, they're doing it because time scrambles are a bit more fun on computer. Um, and also it just, it, it digitizes the whole thing and it gives it the esports feel. The joke that I made in yesterday's video recapping it was the fact that like, you know, League of Legends is the same thing. It's a bunch of people, they fly, they play in Madison Square Garden, but you cannot play real life League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I think it's just the difference, yeah. <laughs> um, that's, you know, in chess, you can just put it right there. So it's, it, yeah, of, co- of course, of course, it's uh, it's different. It's totally different. Um, yeah, but yeah, you mentioned time scrambles. I, I do not believe that there is anything better than the real time time scramble, basically. Yeah, just... like pieces are, you know, like literally flying in the air across the board. And, you know, like one of the opponents gets upset and, you know, hits the clock back and says, you know, correct that. Yeah. And <laughs> basically, this is fun. You know, back in the days playing those, you know, kind of night marathons, for example, when everybody, you know, like towards, you know, midnight would be kind of under 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 influence already, you know, by after drinking so many beers and people would be starting to argue and time scrambles, you know, stuff like that. Nothing's going to replace this, I guess. This is the most human version of chess I can imagine. Yeah, I think that's that, that's uh, that's fair. Um, uh, on the on the subject of actual physical pieces, uh, you you came back from Olympiad recently. Was it your first time in India and only time in India? I can imagine, uh, right? First, first time, definitely first time in India. How was the experience? I saw all these reports. Like hospitality was just incredible. It's like in the Indian culture, it was like very nice to play there and everything. And do you echo yeah. those sentiments? Absolutely. So I mean, this is, was probably like the 
Um, you know, from the perspective of organization, this was the best tournament that I've ever taken part in. And on the other hand, uh, you know, I didn't know, I'm not really sure whether I managed to cope with the climate, the weather, and the uh, fauna, the flora and fauna, you know, like well enough out there, because you need to know that the uh, temperatures, uh, you know, they oscillated between, I don't know, like 36 to 41 during the day. The air humidity uh, was like 60, between 60 and 80 percent. So that's quite a lot. You, know, you try to catch a deeper breath and you regret it immediately you try doing that. <laughs> uh, also, you know, like the fun part was that you know, the, the fauna part, actually, you know, like, uh, I had a whole ha family of lizards uh, living in my apartment with me, yeah, and they <laughs> actually did kind of chase each other, you know, back and forth all the time, you know, across the walls, uh, but it could have gotten worse, like a teammate of mine, she was uh, having a walk, and uh, like a yellow viper fell from a branch above her on her shoulders, yeah, wow. and she started screaming, Whereas the viper was more terrified, and she ran away. The, the viper ran away. <laughs> I mean, it crawled away. Yeah? Oh my god! And, uh, I heard one Ukrainian player as he was, you know, like doing some order in his room. You know, like he found the tarantula spider. You know, like between the t-shirts. You know, that he was folding. So um, <laughs> let's put it this way. I mean, um, organization perfect. You know, like a, like a very nice, memorable experience. <clears throat> But on the other hand, some things, you know, clearly uh, in some respect, and from a certain perspective, I do prefer Europe by all means, by all means. Yeah, I mean, when it goes for the performance, at least of my team, I mean, the, the man, yeah, objectively speaking, underperformed everybody except for Mateusz Bardo. I'm pretty sure that you've heard about Mateusz Bardo. He won the board five or something. Yeah, he won the... exactly. The funny part being, however, that before the tournament, everybody said in, in my country that, you know, the first four boards are like, uh, you know, like the Iron Squad, and it's only the question about board five who's going to be nominated. Yeah, and you know, like uh, most of the people who were, you know, like on the first four boards there, they uh, either underperformed or, or maybe you know got some kind of break even result, or maybe you know like were completely you know like messed up the tournament like myself. Whereas it was exactly Mateusz who scored plus twenty and in, in gold on you know, the fifth board, and I was particularly happy for him because. You know, during the last couple of years, uh, he was also, you know, like a just uh, just 24 commentator, as far as I remember. Uh, basically, he earned, you know, like a fair number of haters. Yeah, you know, like people who, you know, like uh, would kind of uh, literally, you know, verbally abuse him, you know, like for any given reason, you know, on any given day, you know. And they would claim that he's weak, that he is not meant to represent the team anymore, that he's a disgrace, etc. You could actually, you know, like. Uh, uh, like uh, literally paint the room with all of those insults, you know, the walls with the insults, you know, because there were so many of them. And he actually closed the mouths of the haters this way. Yeah? So I'm particularly, particularly happy for him, particularly happy that he did perform so well because he totally deserves it. Wow, I had I had no idea that that was a thing. I mean, uh, that people actually, that many people would write to a person uh, based on poor chess performance. Uh, um, I, I think it was Johann Sebastian Christensen who made some tweets saying that he was getting hate mail in Norwegian. I, I guess chess has grown to that point, you know, because famous athletes get thousands of these messages from just nobody's on the internet, but they're too big. They have social media managers. They don't, they don't even see those messages. But <clears throat> chess players don't have their direct messaging off. We never, that was never a thing, right? We never had to do that. So yeah, it's... you know what? Well, basically, everybody has heard about soccer hooligans, but yeah, 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 yeah. chess hooligans. Yeah, I mean, that's a thing. That's a thing, actually. Uh, I did receive uh, an email or two in, uh, during uh, during my lifetime, uh, which didn't which emails they didn't contain threats, but they did contain very unpleasant statements about my person, such as player. I'd say it put mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. Uh, I do not recall any swear words in those emails, but those people were very unpleasant. And you know, me thinking about it twice, I already you know like deleted the emails just because I didn't want to think about it anymore. But the thing is that imagine yourself kind of uh, uh, rooting for somebody, the person fails despite efforts, and the first thing that you do is is it going to be is it a normal person that you know the first thing that he or she does is to Google the email address of that person and you know, like start insulting them from an anonymous account that they create just for the purpose of insulting the person. 
Yeah? And this is not really traceable as far as I know. And I'm not even in, interested you know, in tracing such people. But on the other hand, this is becoming a thing slowly that people, you know, like do, uh, I mean, they should know their limits a little bit. You know, the, also that the players that represent the country in the given case, that they are also doing their best. That they are also, you know, they've been nominated not without reason. Uh, that they've been nominated because they've been playing well so far. So if they have like a slightly worse performance, like once, for example, they do not deserve all the verbal abuse that they that they get, or maybe the verbal abuse that the people who write to them believe that they deserve. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I mean, <clears throat> there's uh, we could talk on and on about the whole psychology of doing such things, but I think I think it can basically be chalked up to the fact that it's the internet. People who get anonymity suddenly get very empowered uh, and very brave. Uh, I always, I always voice the same thing to the community. I have, uh, I have some people who like to, you know, say things just for attention. Uh, some people only say things about my wife, for example. Like if my wife is sitting next to me and they think like, oh, I can't bother him. He has thick skin, you know. But I'm gonna say something to his wife. And I always just say, like, if you wouldn't say this to someone in person, you probably shouldn't do it on the internet. Unfortunately, yeah. it's, it doesn't always work this way because clearly there is a nice little barrier there where nothing, you know, nothing can happen. Um, you know, I uh, <clears throat> uh, th there's a there's a, a funny. I have like a little funny story um, where uh, I, I I won't share all the details, but basically, you know, this thing where. If, if someone's talking trash online, it's like, oh, like, meet me in person, you know, like, oh, <laughs> 1v1 me IRL, bro, you know, uh -huh. um, in, in, it's, there's no such thing uh, kind of in, in, in chess. But like growing up, I had one of these instances where I actually knew the person and they were like being very, you know, rude online and everything. And um, I, I decided, hey, man, like, if you're going to talk to me, like I was like 12. Okay, I was like a 12 year old kid. I was like, dude, why are you being mean to me online? Like, I'm going to show up to your house. Like, we can fight. You know, I, don't, I didn't know how to fight. I was 12. Um, and I showed up to his house. I showed up to his house. And I knocked on the door. His whole family's there. Like, big family. Like, eight people. I'm like, can I speak to the kid? <laughs> and they're like, okay, sure. So he comes down the stairs. And at this point, I don't know what to do. You know, I don't, like, I, did, I never thought we would make it that far. And I kind of yeah, said, like... I've got a suggestion, actually. I've got the suggestion because mm -hmm. I've got this one... A really devoted hater of mine, you know, like the, the type of a person who just waits for, you know, like a mishap, you know, for, you know, like a slip of yours, you know, for something that you do wrong in his opinion. And basically, you know, he has been particularly direct in his way of putting, putting it online that, you know, that what he thinks about my chess performances in general. If I, if I lose a game, he's going to be yeah, scolding me publicly. If I win a game, he either, he remains silent or maybe he tries to degrade the, the, the level of success basically. Uh -huh. right? so what i did i uh, did kind of uh, you know do a print screen of a couple of comments of his and he did one huge mistake i need to tell you namely he uses a nickname that is universal for many kind of uh, servers many kind of platforms right and you know he has you know like he uses the same nickname at facebook you know pinterest you know etc and on some of those platforms he mentions his true name and surname basically. And I checked the guy actually because you know his comments were particularly upsetting, let's put it like this. Yeah, without without uh, like an objective cause, without an objective reason for them being you know so so kind of insulting. And it turned out that that's a guy from my home city whom I know personally. And when I meet him in person, he's always super kind, super kind, super nice. We exchange a few words, you know, do some small chit chat, etc. La la la. We smile to each other. We're very, very, he's very polite to me. But when he goes to the internet, he turns into like a human beast, basically. Like a human wow. beast. Wow. I have those prints, those, those screens printed out. And I'm, you know, like playing with the thought, you know, playing with the thought of, you know, like meeting him one day, showing him the, 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 the printouts and asking, well, can you tell me something about this, basically? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe this is exactly what you should have done. Yeah? But then again, you know, on a positive note, I'd say that. Uh, people who have haters are generally successful in life. Yeah, so, yeah. So you can be proud of yourself, yeah. Because the more haters you have, the better for you. Uh, it it tells a lot about you know the level of success 
that you've achieved in your life. And it can only get better from this point on. Uh, only people who do not know, do not do anything, they have no haters because there is nothing to be hated. About. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I know there's a saying, if, you, if you're not getting hated on, you're not, you're not, you're not doing anything or something, <laughs> exactly. or some, something like that. Exactly. Um, so luckily, you know, like the vast majority of, you know, like the chess audience are super cool, super nice people. Uh, I, you know, after, you know, like the terrible performance I did at the Olympiad, I got, you know, like immense amount of emails from people whom I didn't even know before who would be actually consoling me, who, you know, would be actually saying, okay, uh, you can do better next time. You are going to do better. Uh, it was just, you know, like a work accident, let's call it. Yeah, we still keep our fingers crossed for you. And that's hyper nice, super nice. I always respond to such emails because if somebody takes, you know, like a little bit of time of their own, their free time to do some good, to help out somebody else, they do deserve more from life. I guess they do deserve, you know, the best also from them, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are, you know, like serious topics on one hand. On the other hand, uh, you know, I do not want to leave this impression that, you know, like being the chess professional is all about being hated <laughs> and all about, you know, like reading, you know, bad emails about oneself. I mean, there are so many good things, you know, about being, you know, a chess player or a chess coach. In particular, a chess coach, when, for example, imagine seeing your FM student, you know, like a 17 year old, you know, claiming his first GM norm, yeah. This is like really encouraging, really lots of fun. I sometimes get the impression that there is this more, that this was like a huge, like a bigger pleasure to me uh, than like winning a tournament myself. Yeah. I don't know if you if you had this if you shared the same experiences because you did as far as I know you did play a lot and you do some coaching as well simultaneously, right? Yeah, I I would I would agree. Uh, there's a lot of good that comes out of seeing your students succeed. I mean, I, I was coaching on a much different level, but uh, like I was coaching private school kids who for them chess was one of five activities. So they were not winning the the third grade open section of the state championship. They were winning the third grade under 1200 rated section, right? So I would never say that they were the third grade champions because the third graders of New York are rated like 1800. Uh -huh. um, and that's a very important distinction. I used to hate when people were like, oh, we're the kindergarten national champions. Yeah, of the unrated section. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> it's still something. <laughs> yeah, you know, it... which, is, which is fine. But don't say you beat, you know, the 1500 rated kindergartners who are going to yeah, be, you know... It's small, but it's honest work, as they say. Yeah, <laughs> it's true, but you have to, you know, you have to... Uh... So there's this little distinction. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was always very fun to see my students succeed. Uh, first of all, uh, as, as a coach. Uh, and second of all, Listen, the more success, the better. The more success of your chess program, the more people want private lessons, the more people. So, like, that was always uh, very fun. To be honest, um, maybe now, looking back, I don't, I don't remember it with the same positive emotions. I'm sure when I, when I was in the moment, uh, it felt kind of surreal. Like, I remember clinching a couple of norms, uh, and uh, I still never really fully believed that uh, it was happening. Uh, I never... I, when I clinched my AM norms, it wasn't like, okay, this is just a step in my journey to becoming GM. It was like, oh my God, I never thought this was possible. Wow. Uh, which is probably one of the reasons um, even now I, I struggle in some of these like GM norm events because I'm not in the mindset of I should be here and I should be succeeding. I'm still in the mindset of like, oh, we'll see what happens. Not to mention when I go to tournaments now, it's totally different. Like I'm not putting in the necessary amount of work uh, and I'm... Yeah, I'm not approaching it from the same uh, perspective of like an expected result. Uh, but yeah, I think the, that's a long answer. But the short answer is uh, it's definitely a totally different experience watching your, your, your students succeed. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also like it's also you know it all depends on the construction of one's psyche I would say whether you prefer you know like your own success or, or the success of your students at the end of the day however the success of your students is also your success when you think about it right also you know like this kind of a uh, sensation of completing you know like an IM title you know like uh, again obtaining a GM norm uh, I remember when I completed my my first GM norm I got depression for like three days. Like literally I would lie in my bed for three days straight and stare at the ceiling uh, because I was like, what now? What oh my, now? Yeah. What next? Right, basically. And there would be people who'd be like partying, getting getting drunk, basically uh, enjoying themselves, etc. 
I was like, what next? Wow. I mean, is it really the end? Exactly. What well, it means, of course, is obviously, you know, the struggle for rating. Yeah? But this is already different. There's no super GM pilot, for example. You know, you've made it till the end of the road. What to do now? Wow. Well, that's... Can you imagine how the world champion feels? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and this is also another interesting topic, actually, because there were so many people who you know, like uh, surprisingly, uh, at least to me, uh, they not only criticized Magnus's decision, but they also wanted to like punish him somehow, you know, I don't know, like strip him of his previous titles. There were such, such suggestions, by the way. And, uh, you know, I, I consider this to be hilarious. He's, you know, he's, he's been like a five times world champion. He's proven uh, that he's like the best player in the world, uh, you know, like uh, currently in the contemporary chess world. Um, so he deserves, you know, like uh, that he his decision needs to be respected, right? He's not giving up on chess. He's going to keep on playing. You know, if he if he followed his performance, you know, at the Olympiad, you did see that no matter what, you know, like even if the Nor Norwegian team was totally underperforming, you know, they had the worst event in years probably, uh, he kept on playing, he kept on playing against 2400 rated players even, whereas we do know people who, uh, you know, like uh, who are rated 2700 plus and they're not gonna, they're not gonna kind of, uh, yeah, go and, you know, compete against 2400s because they deem them as being unworthy. Example, yeah, but I do not want to go into details on that one. Yeah? Just, 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 just my opinion on the on the whole kind of story regarding the World Championship match. Actually, uh, I think that the match between uh, Nepo and uh, and the Ding is is like a breath of fresh air a little bit, yeah, because uh, you know Magnus, you know, is clearly the best player in the world. Let's see how to slightly worse but still super strong players you know that compete against each other uh their styles are completely different and this can you know actually lead to some very interesting games I guess. who do you think is the favorite i i was asked this question and i i think it's 55 45 but i don't know to whom i feel like nepo's experience going through the match already is more significant than ding's kind of stability but that's just my opinion. I have no clue. Maybe Ding's stability overshoots uh, Nepo's experience because Nepo could be a little bit more unstable, but I have no clue. Hard uh, to say, actually. I mean, you know, during the previous World Championship match, Nepo was able to, you know, play like only five games on a relatively balanced level, I'd say. That he was, you know, like a worthy, that he was showing, demonstrating to the world that he was a worthy challenger to, to Magnus. Then again, Ding is not Magnus. Right, so uh, clearly the chances, the odds that you know that Nepo is going to become a world champion, they they do increase, you know, substantially. I'd say. Uh, also, there are two different players, you know, when it goes for the playing style. Ding is more positional, in, positional in nature, whereas uh, Nepo is like very, very concrete. Right, he likes to he likes to calculate lines till the very end, and this is something that has been bringing him like an immense uh, amount, a number of points recently. So I I think personally, for the time being, I would go with with Nepo, I, would, I feel that his chances are slightly preferable in this duel. Then again, um, you know, Ding is not to be underestimated. He's al also 2800 rated as far as I can, uh, as far as I know right now. So this is certainly going to be a very interesting match. Nothing, uh, nothing compared to this to the things that we've seen before. Mm -hmm. One more fun, fun conversation. Uh, I don't do a whole lot of big picture abstract thinking, but sometimes I. I like to have these little debates in my mind. So it's no question Magnus is the best player, right, in, in, in the world. But if you take everything, if you take classical, rapid, blitz, everything, online, everything, who are the five best chess players in the world right now? I guess who are the other four, if not, if not Magnus? I, I'm like not... I'm not against saying that Hikaru is the second best chess player in the world because of everything, like all his success in Rapid and Blitz and his recent classical success. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, you know, I don't know. Is it like Hikaru, Ding, Nepo? Who's the fifth? Like, just overall, who, is the, who are the five best chess players in the world I right now? I will surprise you a little bit. If you, if you kind of reduce this question to like, like the fifth person on the list, yeah, because you did mention like the, like the four top guys, I would go with Abdus Sattar right now. Wow. Because you know, like he he won the Rapid World Championships in Warsaw mm -hmm. last year. He's been very successful recently in over the board play. According to his coach Ivan Sokolov in his latest interview, 
I mean, he claims that Abdul Safarov is very close to Paulson right now. Uh, I'm not even looking at his current rating. I'm looking at the momentum of his rating increased, right? He used to be 2600 rated. And he, at first, he was like the youngest grandmaster, you know, like la la la. And now all of a sudden, he breaches the 2700 barrier with a bang, with a bang, which is right. So Uzbekistan has won the Olympiad. He's been very instrumental and, in, you know, like helping out the team to, to, to win gold eventually. Uh, so I think that Abdul Sotorov is like, the fifth and who knows maybe could be the sixth one maybe Gukesh maybe Gukesh your your prolific previous guest <laughs> yeah that podcast interview was insane man <laughs> people were uh, I watched it watched it yeah I liked it too it yeah. got no, the interview itself was not insane but the amount of traction it got from I think I think people uh, yeah people were super excited um People were super excited to, uh, to to listen to Gukesh. It's a soft-spoken killer. He just, uh, but I, yeah, he. I, I like how I asked him what uh, where he gets his confidence from, and he said, "I don't know." Yeah, That's... when I when I watched the interview, I was like, uh, the, the, "There's this catchphrase, kill him with kindness." That he that Gukesh gives the, this catchphrase a completely different meaning, I would say, because he's so kind, but he's so super strong, such a beast. Basically, right at the same time. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's one of the players at the who you know at the Olympiad who was you know winning game after games. You know, he was standing on eight out of eight as far as I remember, which is completely insane for the men's section, right? Yeah. For example, on my team, you know, in the female section, there was this uh, also super talented player Olivia Kilbas on debut. Yeah. She was standing on nine out of nine, and it, it was very close, you know, to like uh, to a full house. I would say eleven out of eleven, judging by the course of their games out there, right? So, you know, if somebody scores eight out of eight or nine out of nine at the Olympiad, there has to be simply something special about this kind of person. Yeah, it's 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 unbelievable. I was trying to ask Gukesh if if it was sort of a little bit of a phenomenon like. When you play someone who's eight out of eight, you're the opponent. Part of you is like, I'm gonna stop this streak. But the longer the game goes, your mindset is definitely going to be like, oh my god, am I gonna be another casualty? <laughs> you know, um... Well, some people think that way, but some people say they, they they get intimidated by you know having have to by the sole thought of having have to face a monster like that. Yeah. and they start thinking okay nine out of nine this cannot be a coincidence so yeah am i gonna be the next casualty out here definitely so uh, on the other hand we we need to admit that you know because you did also like a video on the performance of the canadian uh, sean rodrigo yeah yeah so those people you know who scored like eight out of eight nine out of nine they do have something in common yeah it's not only like the influence of luck over the results because although luck has not been the dominant kind of element deciding that they did score so well it was always there yeah it was always there those games weren't not all of those games were you know straightforward wins you know from the from the beginning till the end but those people they have this rare rare kind of um, skill that they they're capable of constantly creating problems difficulties for their opponents and their opponents although they're also strong typically they they do not perceive just like that and they crack under pressure you know uh, at a certain point of time so gukash kobasa exactly sean or really on a slightly lower level but still yeah basically they have this kind of a trait this kind of trait that i'm very interested myself in in acquiring but it's like very difficult to you know even to as a coach to figure out a way how to do that yeah endless endless calculation trainings on the one hand the trainings with the, the skill of swindling we could you know we could learn a little bit from karen or our common friend again yeah, on this one i don't know if you if, if you've heard about it but with karen there was this contest organized by new in chess and basically it was about submitting the 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 nicest swindle you know the, this was the contest for the best swindle karen submitted, submitted his game where he was cruising you know a queen down throughout the game and won eventually and he won the contest you know <laughs> so you know when i like Talking about my greatest, you know, like training achievements. I have a couple of people who became, you know, like who made it from IM to GM, from FM to IM. But Kyron is all, also among them. You know, the best swindle swindler of year 2021. <laughs> uh, I either have a horrible memory or he never told me this. <laughs> uh, yeah, you see. <laughs> what? Well, I'm gonna. 
there are no. some things that you only say to a coach and nobody else. No, just joking. Obviously, obviously, oh, it was like a like a like a well, well no, sorry. Actually, I'm surprised that you didn't know anything about this. Honestly, Vojcik, uh, the last two years are kind of a blur. I forget basically everything that's not related to my career uh, or my wife and my household. So um, yeah, that wouldn't well, wouldn't shock me. I mean, yeah, he has pulled off some pretty incredible saves. Uh, that's that's so funny though. Wow, um, I gotta talk to him about that. It's a skill. Listen, I mean, prolonging a game in a in a bad position, right? Like Abdul Satorov did that against Gukesh. You just you just keep playing moves. Uh, one, one, I think I told the story in a recent podcast or maybe on stream recently. But um, my friend, uh, one of my other friends, played um against Ilya Nuzhnyuk, and playing playing Nuzhnyuk is really tough because he just he plays fast and he has this way of like playing fast, solid moves. A lot of GMs do that. And he, he just beats you down, like, over time. You have to be really good at deflecting that kind of play style uh, and capitalizing when he makes inaccuracies. And he beat my friend, and they were talking after, and Nizhnik is just like, ah, you know, I just make moves. Uh-huh, like, exactly. Oh, when I just make moves, you know, I play, like, 2200. <laughs> I mean, but there are like people who just know which square does the given piece belong to. Yeah, there are some people who have played so much already in the, during the lifetime that they gain this kind of a Capablanca like feeling that they simply have to do this and that and it's going to be okay. This is the best idea. Those people tend not to pay too much attention to like the uh, objective value of the move. They are complete kind of, you know, they're like complete opposites of Kasparov, for example, who always wanted, insisted on playing the best move in the given position. They just, you know, their, their thought process is governed by a plan that they worked out and they know which kind of steps are required for the plan to work. If they spend any time on a given move, they just want to blunder check it. They just want to make sure that it, uh, that it works, that it, doesn't, that it isn't easily refutable tactically, I would say. Otherwise, they simply know that it has to be, that it simply has to be a good move. And Nishnik, I think that he's a great example of this kind of approach. Uh, last year, the European teams in the, in, the, in the last round, we played the decisive match against Georgia. I, I forgot the name of the player who I was playing against, but he was very famous for uh, playing games, you know, literally offhand. He's a grandmaster rated 2470 back then, as far as I remember. And I can imagine, I, I remember, you know, like at least 10 people warning me against him that he's super dangerous, super strong, right? That, that he plays, you know, like the every single tournament that he does, he plays every game in it, you know, offhand. I, I forgot the name, I'm sorry for that. But the thing is that, you know, that's, that's the humorous part that in the same tournament he played against my friend Maxime Lagarde. And <laughs> He spent like five minutes on the whole game, although this is a standard game at the European teams, a very important tournament. And then when he when we played against each other, he spent 30 minutes. And my teammates were like, wow, he played so slow against you. <laughs> so, so you get the point, but it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really change anything about my admiration for him, that he can he is capable of playing a game against a super grandmaster like. Maxime Lagarde, he can spend five minutes on the game, right? And he can obtain the draw rather easily, judging by his course, whereas Maxime spent like 80 minutes on this on the same kind of moves that he was doing. You can imagine this, right? Yeah, it's so frustrating. I've played a few people like that. Um, I think uh, nothing in recent memory, but Nizhnik is the best example. Uh, I mean, he just he just plays every move so fast. And the problem with playing guys who play every move in a minute or two is like, for the opening stage, you're like, oh my God, is this prep? And then you get to the middle game and you're like, oh my God, is this prep? And then if it's not prep, you're like, oh my God, have I done something wrong? Why is he playing so fast? And then he starts thinking, like he thinks for like eight minutes. You're like, it's a mix of, oh, I got him or maybe I messed up and now he's going to punish me because he's actually thinking. Yeah. It's just... The best thing to do, the best antidote to this to those situations is simply not to overthink. This is number one, right? Because be, uh, he may be playing mind games on you. He might be uh, he might be well still into still in the theory, but he wants to kind of pretend that he's out of book. And then when you kind of uh, uh, you know when you start thinking, oh yeah, now we're on our own, then he starts you know lashing moves, you know like fifteen moves again, you know basically offhand. Yeah, and yeah. then you, you get a complete you know kind of. Uh, your your mind melts literally at that, at that point. And so the best thing, the thing that I do, is simply to play, you know, based on my pace of the game, based on you know what I need, how much time I need to spend on a given move. Right? I know that he's playing fast. On the other hand, why would I care? 
I just need to make sure that I'm not getting myself into time trouble, right? If he plays fast, the chances that he's going to be committing an accuracy also increases, right? So if you think about it like this and not start thinking about, you know, overthinking psychologically, then it's rarely that you're going to go wrong. Like this. And then it's, re it's really going to be the case that you're going to be suffering, you know, that you're going to be making a, a committing a mistake exactly because of your mental attitude at the given moment. I remembered uh, the player, the last player I played who played like this. I, I, I think you remember this game because we were we were working together at this time. I played um, Demidov, Mikhail okay. Demidov in uh, okay. in in Pardubice. Yeah, that was a that was a horrible uh, that was a nightmare pairing because this guy is like twenty five forty IM with mm -hmm. like one GM norm, and all he does, it seems, like a lot of these Russian title players, they just play like World Rapid and Blitz anytime it's in Russia. They get like incredible results. Mm -hmm. um, this guy's like 2950 Blitz, exactly. and he just plays like whatever he wants. And, and I remember you, you had sent me some anti-ready file, and I played, the, I played the file, and this dude just blitzed every move, and it wasn't theory. <laughs> it wasn't theory, he had never played it before. And he just like shuffled his pieces around and then just killed me. Like I just. <laughs> <it was> like, <laughs> I think it was the E3 English, as far as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He played like B3, oh. a bishop B2. He just. Psh, to yeah. my defense, though, to my defense, I can say that he didn't get an edge out of the open. No, he didn't. He didn't. Yeah. yeah, like I'm not saying his prep was good. I'm just saying like it was. I was like, what do I? Do? I got all my prep on the board. Now what? I guess he's just a better player, more experienced. I don't know. Playing. Yeah, he just knew what to do, kept on playing, right? He didn't really pay so much attention to, to you know, like a concrete, deep quality of the moves. He was just, you know, kind of, uh, he had the plan in mind and he let he let it kind of uh, guide him. You know? this, this is how it works. There are such people and there are such systems, you know, that they can employ in your games. Uh, I think that there are some people who even construct their opening repertoires, even on GM level, based on simple systems when, in which the risk that they're going to go wrong it's nullified. Yeah? So, for mm. example, in E3 English, some kind of retties, you know, some kind of uh, uh, safe, you know, closed setups, so-called so bunker up setups, right? The stuff like this, and they know what to do. Some, some, you know, ideas related to E3 after D4, right? They simply know what to do. They know everything about those systems, and they have something that I call like the feel for the position, right? And they are particularly dangerous because you do understand already during preparation that they know their stuff. They know all their stuff, and also the uh, you know like the theory on the on the lines that they play is so limited and so simple that their chances of uh, of winning the game potentially are strongly reduced already before you make the first move. You just there's no other antidote to this kind of uh, type of a player but to outplay them just to play better chess, not to expect that they're gonna catch them into some kind of opening prep. You just need to be stronger, and eventually in the end game maybe he's gonna start making mistakes. Um, you are a published author. You have a book, uh, Universal Chess Training, and it's a very intense book. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. I, you also, uh, I don't know about the second one, but uh, I don't know if it's a work in progress or whatever. But um, yeah, talk talk to me about what what it's like to write a book. I feel like it comes with a whole new set of pressure because a book is is permanent. Like a book is is there. Uh, it it's also less like a painting, where like a painting can be interpreted God knows how many ways, right? It's like open for interpretation. Like a book is a book. Like it has to be correct. It has to be good. The material has to be of a quality to improve, help people improve a chess. So, yeah, can you take me through that process of what it was like to write the book and all the all the different you know emotions associated and. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, like what maybe the target audience for, for the book, who would have the most success using it and so on? Well, sure. Uh, first thing, I mean, I think I need to start with the motivation. Why why do I write at all? Uh, because I believe that, you know, if you spend, you know, like something like 20, 25 years you know, beating on your craft, you know, like working on, on you know, like on chess as such as a game, basically you tend to acquire a lot of knowledge on the, on the given topic. And it would be a huge pity if, you know, this kind of knowledge went with you together one day, you know, like when you're already very old, the grave. Yeah, it would be like, like, uh, like a shame, I'd say. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, writing for me personally is also a form of, uh, of autotherapy, I'd say, like some kind of a training, or a training method. Because uh, I know if you've noticed, but I've been writing books about the things I've been personally struggling with. 
For example, my first book, Universal Chess Training, is about, uh, you know, about this kind of universal training system, you know, in the area of, stra of chess strategy uh, that allows you to, you know, like um, work on this kind of area of the game in a way that is going to help you kind of prepare for the majority of problems that you're going to get in your games, that you're going to be confronted with in your own game, statistically speaking, right? So uh, I'm not going to be going too deeply into that. There is this method five, five, um, you know, major uh, kind of, uh, you know, questions, problems, you know, like coordination, static dynamics, so, you know, like playing against weaknesses, etc. cetera. Uh, if you're interested, if people are interested, they can, they're obviously very much welcome to, to purchase the book. Um, the point being that, you know, when I, when I'm self-taught, predominantly self-taught, yeah? So I did have some coaches back in the days, but uh, th this lasted, you know, maybe a year or two, right? And we didn't meet, you know, like every week as we did, for example, right? We rather had some training sessions, et cetera, right? So I, in order to become stronger, in order to ascend, I needed to understand, you know, like what just training is all about. And, you know, the first book is exactly like a, like a byproduct of my struggle. Uh, so uh, the thing is that I wrote th this kind of book because I came to the conclusion because that, I'm sorry that some people are going to have the same type of problem that I did. Yeah, and as, uh, judging by the feedback that I've been receiving, actually this is exactly like an Achilles heel of the statistical Achilles heel of a wider uh, chess public that there is. Yeah? My se second book that I'm going to be publishing around May 2023, uh, titled uh, "Supreme Chess Understanding Statics and Dynamics." It's another kind of Achilles heel of mine, you know, like sensing critical positions, dealing with certain imbalances. Imagine yourself having like a static advantage, let's say the bishop pair and your opponent, however, but your opponent being however dynamic in the meantime, you know, having been very active at the, at the same time, how to deal with that, which advantage is more, more important, or maybe is it always about advantages, or maybe rather that sometimes you're at a disadvantage, but he's at a disadvantage as well. How do those things correlate with each other, right? This is all what this book is going to be all about, and it's a niche, if you think about it, right? You, you can do like a quick, you know, like research of the chess, the chess book market, and you're going to see that there are books that have the, type, the word dynamic in it, right, in the title. But do they really talk about those things a lot? I doubt, I doubt. After doing like a big recon, I, I can say that I doubt that this is the case. So this is also, you know, about filling in the niche, making sure that there are some people, you know, like trying to make sure that, especially that there are some people who are already, you know, kind of advanced when it goes for their chess education, but they do not have a coach, for example, who would help them out with this one, this, with this kind of topic. And at the same time, this is also a type of a topic which I would say that people struggle in general with notwithstanding their current level. So you're always going to, in other words, you're always going to hear grandmasters complaining about not sensing the critical moment, that they play too passively at the given, at the given kind of part of the game. Uh, and, you know, I'm there to help. Yeah? My third book, if it ever materializes, is going to be about calculation because calculation is, you know, like yet another weakness of mine. Yeah? And by this, by writing those books, I actually try to improve myself. And if on top of that, I earn a little bit of money and maybe I do kind of get the chance to start some interesting cooperations, even better, even better. But then again, it's, uh, it's me trying to help others by helping myself by helping others. And yeah? this is my main motivation when writing the book. Obviously, it's not always easy. It's not, you know, all uh, sunshine and rainbows, as they say, because there are going to be days when you wake up in the morning and you're like procrastinating. And you definitely know that you, that the one thing that you do not want to do today is writing, but you need to force yourself. You, know? you need to kind of tell yourself, okay, just one page, half a page, you know, just five sentences. You know? And before you notice it, you are, you're booted in, you're like writing, you know, endlessly, and you're so happy that you actually discovered some kind of interesting thing that you might want to mention that's going to enrich the reader. The, the reader whom you do not know, but you suppose that he or she might have this kind of specific problem. Yeah, my mom is a journalist and a writer, and uh, frequently she has to just isolate herself for periods at a time uh, and just, you know, get to writing. It's a little bit different, I guess, when you're writing chess versus non-chess subjects. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure it's even more different when you have to write fiction because you have to enter like a totally different universe in your mind. Chess is very, you don't need to enter a totally different universe. Uh, and the same goes for non-fiction. I mean, it's all there. So, uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it's like to, uh, to be a writer. I, uh, I, I, I'm definitely 
intimidated by 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 certain things in in the writing sphere because as a as a youtuber it's very diff different to do digital media than it is for a book i'm very intimidated by print on a page uh, since it it's there like it's permanent and it has to be whatever you put there has to be the most correct and efficient uh product for people to improve their game i mean in your case like i i feel as though when you're maybe 2000 plus it's a little bit open to interpretation and everybody has strengths and weaknesses so you know you can argue if it's the, be the, be the best way of, of improving and it also depends on the person like some people will benefit tremendously from your book and some people will just get i mean they'll get steamrolled and they just i remember one of the first times that i um uh that i tried to study perfect your chess by Volokitin? Yeah, 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 by... Uh -huh. I mean, I, ju I just got obliterated. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the early... You know, imagination in chess is a very... Uh, Pot and the right? Yes. Like I read that, that book was recommended. Crazy. Yeah, that, that book is... Crazy. I used to lie to myself. I was like, <laughs> I was like a 2100 rated kid, and I would like look at the position in the car, and I would be like, I think that's the move. I'd go to the <laughs> solutions and I would say, oh, wow, what I was the, right. Like, yeah, yeah, like, what the... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the first move was correct. I didn't see any of the other crap, but I'd be like, ah, oh, first move was right. I'm so smart. Or I yeah, would like... The, you know, both of those books are ingenious, so let's be honest. On the other hand, to your defense, at least regarding the imagination one, yeah? the uh, imagination one does contain some kind of uh, mistakes. Yeah, so yes, I know, modern yeah. engines do refute a lot of those concepts uh, because this book has been written in the way how books from the 80s and 90s were written, the, 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 in the really lovable style, you know, this kind of really romantic style. You look at the, like, like, like at the concept and you say, wow, this is really beautiful, yeah? yeah? Then you go to a game, it does work, but then, you know, like engines kick in and, you know, instead of plus two for white, it's minus five, yeah? because the engine kind of refutes it immediately. I had this kind of a, a story in my life, you know, when I was, I only started working with engines around 2005, which is kind of a privilege because, you know, before I reached the age of 16 I was just analyzing on my own and this way you learn how to you gain a real playing stream yeah you know, sometimes I get the impression that when I was 16 I would play better I would play better than I do nowadays right just a second uh, I just need to open the door name back, sure. back yeah, to yeah. you right? just sure. a second you know normally I edit out these parts of the podcast folks but I kind of feel like doing something fun today if you're actually here one hour and 20 minutes later thank you for supporting the entire episode i hope you're having a great time uh the youtube audience does get to see me on camera right now just sort of goof goofing off and talking to myself if you're listening to this in the car then oh boy check is back <laughs> okay i'm back chess books chess books i mean as, as means of you know like rebuilding rebuilding myself after the after the link that i purchased you know instantaneously purchased like 30 books 30 books. Wow. And I, and I promised myself that I'm going to do all of them. That I'm going to you know, work hard for all, all of them until the next one, you know, in two years' time from now. Right? I, yeah, when, 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 I, when I wasn't a chess creator, I would feel the same way. I wouldn't just get upset if I had like a bad event. I would get super motivated. I'm like, okay, I'm going home. I'm turning, I'm closing the door. No electricity, no, no sunlight <laughs> like Axel Smith. I'm just going to study these books, you know? Um, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. The most fun thing about having bad tournaments uh, for me used to be drastic measures, you know, massively drastic measures uh, to improve my own game. Actually, I'm talking to a friend of mine and he's looking to overhaul his repertoire completely. I mean, like first move overhaul, not even, you know, variation overhaul, but first move overhaul, uh, completely changing his playing style and, and openings and stuff like that. Yeah, that like for me chess is only interesting if I can constantly get kind of fresh and interesting positions. Um but uh yeah, I you know, uh the, there might be a, another universe where where I where I or I find a way to 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 dedicate the time to studying because studying chess actually is is quite fun uh, because you do feel yourself improving. Uh, of course, the most frustrating thing about it is of course going go, going to those tournaments and and not succeeding uh, because then yeah. you feel as though yeah, all your effort is yeah. But exactly. The training itself is like, uh, I know if you're into the, you know, like comic book space and there was this old, you know, like anti-Superman villain who would be like an energy absorbing uh, entity. 
and you know like uh, doing book after book after book exercise after exercise i feel as if i was absorbing you know all the energy from superman basically and it's like highly motivating then again you know even if you know like imagine my situation you know uh, honestly i've been preparing like seven months straight for the olympia i don't know how much money i've invested in that i did hire my own coaches i did hire people who would be giving you know specific exercises to me playing training games against me super strong players right uh, and you go to a tournament and literally nothing works, you know, like the Murphy's Law, you know, kind of works is at its finest, basically, in your specific case. If it's, you know, uh, as, you know, it could be about opening preparation, could be about being overtrained, could be about, you know, like simply being unlucky, but literally whatever could fail, failed, you know, in my situation. And then you can come back from the tournament, obviously I'm a little bit depressed. It's an under, understatement, obviously, also. And then I say to myself, no, 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 I'm not going to, it's not the end. And I'm not going to give up like that, yeah? So I started, you know, kind of doing a plan, you know, like what to do before the next tournament, what to do in six months' time, what to do in two years' time, analyzing the, the games of very, uh, with a lot of scrutiny, basically, understanding what went wrong, even, you know, the, the little details, right? Not being too easy on, on, on myself, right? And I think that this is the best way to progress. Also, because, you know, as a coach, you know, I've been sharing the best moments with my students and the worst moments of, of theirs, you know, uh, times when they gain 100 LO points on one go and times when they lose 50, for example, yeah, and I always tell them, you know, cheer up, it's going to be, it's going to be fine, just train, and, you know, it's easy to say something like this until you drop 27 points, uh, you know, in one tournament, yeah, and I even did a checkup, you know, I, I checked, and the last time I checked, you know, I lost this kind of a, uh, uh, you know, number of points was never, was never, wow. I never got so, so many points. And to make it even more painful, the last three years of mine are just constant gains, little constant gains, like the, like the, like, like the price of a Coca-Cola stock, basically, right? Only upwards, very delicately, but the tendency is clear, right? And then a huge fall, you know, like in, in like 10 days. So yeah, I mean, I need to rebuild myself. I need to come back stronger. And there are so many things that I need to do in order to be not stronger. But you know what is the additional motivation that I have? That thanks to me becoming stronger, there's a huge chance that my students are also become stronger. They're gonna benefit from my from my failures, from my mistakes, right? And thanks to this, without them being subjected to a rating or rating loss, they are going also to become stronger based on the synergy. Yeah, that's actually very fair. Everything from bouncing back from bad results like this, uh, you know, showing people the the right mindset to have to to actual legitimate tangible work and then uh, what to put in uh, it's very true there sometimes i'm just browsing random people's tournaments history and i'm amazed you know i uh i i saw them a while ago they were 80 to 100 points higher and that's that's sort of my situation like 90 100 points off my peak and then i i just see they they go back up i'm like wow that's exactly but that's, that's also a success story i would say when i was coming back by plane uh, I met Andrei Volokitin along the way. Yeah, he, he lives in Poland currently because of the, you know, like Ukraine and Russia situation, mm -hmm. right? So basically I shared my story with him and he was like, yeah, I mean, like, and that's, uh, he didn't say this word, but he just said, oh, this is, this is, those are rookie numbers, basically, right? He was like 2,690 and then he fell below 2,600, you know, in a short time, within a short time span. But what happened next? People, his rivals, they thought that they sensed weakness and they started playing against him for a win, you know, like at all costs. And before he noticed that, he was 2680 rated again. Yeah? So who knows? Maybe, uh, as they say in my country, that, you know, like fa failure is the fertilizer for success. Right? So who knows? Maybe in, in my case, uh, this is, maybe this is going to be, you know, not only like, the perfect opportunity to bounce back, but maybe, you know, like fate is telling me that this is the way, you know, that if I want to make it to the next level, not only to bounce back, to make it, you know, to become even stronger, I need to change something. And this is how I treat this whole situation. Yeah, it's true. Wow. I looked it up. He was 27, 25 and a year later he was, but maybe even below. Yeah. He was a hundred points lower. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's that stuff is always super impressive to me. Uh, just watching people kind of fall and then and then pick themselves back up. Um, yeah. 
I'm sure it's a skill on its own. Uh, Wojcik, the, the, the last uh, thing I oftentimes sign off uh, these episodes with is uh, like, what's, what, what's next? So what, what tournaments do you have coming up? What, uh, what's the workload? Is it just basically teaching, teaching and, uh, and writing? Or are you playing again soon? And there are Polish teams, which is actually a very strong tournament. Uh, there are teams, uh, you know, like starring six people, five males, one one female, and the other training of the team like that is typically goes in the 2600s, right? So this is a very strong tournament. Uh, everybody, you know, like uh, all the teams, you know, are all the clubs in my country are very fond of those championships in the sense that they will be making sure that the best. Uh, the, everybody is actually looking for reinforcements now. Right, so uh, you know, if there's a team that is 2500 rated on average, that's going to be a huge surprise. Right? Uh, afterwards, uh, it's going to be like the middle of September, which means that I'm going to have like two and a half months until my deadline to submit the manuscript, mm. book, which means that this time is going to be devoted predominantly to writing. All the training is also going to be the thing, training others, training myself. And then in May, uh, May, maybe in March, I'm going to take part in the European uh, individuals, maybe. Uh, if not, then definitely the Polish individuals in, in May, which is always, you know, like a big thing in the, my country, especially since, uh, you know, like the government started, started sponsoring chess you know, heavily. So uh, it's not only about the result, it's also about the funding, you know, like all, all elements to, to play a role here. There are more, there's more than one factor that motivates everybody in this context and this is also going to be the year of the european teams right which is like the second most important team event after the after the olympiad right who knows who knows uh, like the future is going to tell us how it's gonna how it's gonna work sounds good sounds like a lot of fun hopefully uh ho hopefully you know we can get get some of those points back books book is published successfully students continue to uh, have success as well hopefully uh, yeah. The ones that are known and unknown, obviously, we know we know the two that are. I know the two that are known. I don't know any of the other ones. Uh, so well, hopefully. if you're looking for you know like a person to watch out for in a positive sense, uh, I'm currently coaching also the current Polish female champion. Her name is Michalina Rudzinska, which uh, who is also like a huge uh, success story. I need to tell you because uh, she was uh, 2200 rated a, a year ago, as far as I remember. We started out training together in January 2022, and the championship, the national championships, took place in uh, in May or June, as far as I remember. So it was like six months, basically. And the funny part was that she wasn't even supposed to take part in the wow. championships. Uh, she was like the first reserve player, uh, and she only uh, was allowed because you know one of the players you know signed up, basically. So she was the last oh. seed. Last year, she was last, and she was also the last seed. And this year, she won the tournament with a round to spare. Wow. Ahead of all the, all the big names like Sochko, uh, Zavatska, Kilbasa also, right? And she gained like an impossible number of points and she paved the way to be, for herself to be nominated for the, for the national team that's, uh, where she also played, as she also played in India. So, you know, like just Cinderella, I call her. Just Cinderella, definitely. Well, hopefully, Pavel can also be chess Cinderella. <laughs> <laughs> well, he needs to lose some weight if he wants to you know, aspire to become Cinderella, because you know, like those little little kind of uh, uh, glass shoes, right? Yeah, he... Cinderella the glass shoes. They're not gonna handle it. <laughs> he can be Cinderella in boots. Uh, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are so many players who are like big, who are like big, and they are still twenty seven hundred. So I think that, objectively speaking, that he's like like the Pavel, Pavel is like the like next Firuja, the Polish Firuja, and it's just up to him whether he's going to become 2750, 2700, 2650. I didn't even wish to go below and, you know, like mentioning the ratings. I, I feel as if 2650 was the least he can do. If he not, does nothing, if he procrastinates, he's going to become 2650, right? He's so talented and so, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the future is ahead of him for sure. Yeah? That's a good, uh, it's a nice positive note to sign off on. I, I will say uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of very strong players in the world. I, I, when I was younger, one of my, one of my friends said something like, uh, anytime you see a giant chess player who's like six feet tall, six one, you know, six five, like Kramnik, it's like, you say, man, they're super tall for no reason. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they're super tall 
All they're gonna have is neck neck and back problems playing chess. You know why don't they play basketball? Why don't they do some fighting or something? You know why they why yeah, they play yeah chess? like one final story from my side. Like a GM friend of mine that was once participating in this kind of open tournament. He was playing against a lady and he and he committed the bad blunder. He lost. Then he was paired against a guy who was you know like really tall. You know like 100 kilos of of you know like living flesh, right? And he also lost the game. And then. In the third round, he was paired against a guy from, I don't know, like from the, one of those Eastern Baltic countries who was like, like the fattest guy, you know, in the, in, on the, in the playing venue, basically 140 at the very least, you know, very short, but very, very wide, basically. And, you know, like my, uh, my friend almost burst into tears because he said something like this, uh, how am I supposed to bounce back? If I keep on getting heavier and heavier opponents, you know? <laughs> and you know, like if, if you know some Slavic languages, I know that you're fluent in Russian. You get the point. You get the point. The, mean, the meaning of the word heavier, right? So he meant tougher. He meant tougher, but in this context, it you know sounded very fun. Uh, yeah, I had um, I had a, I had a lot of fun uh, playing some of these some of these European events, uh, and and yeah, you get you get people from all over the world. Uh, I'll sign off with a with also a, a very brief funny story from my side. There, I I once was sitting next to two, uh, two guys uh, in in one of one of my tournaments. Uh, one looked like a clean cut younger guy, you know, nice haircut, everything. Another guy was like an older guy, looked a little bit, it didn't shave in a while, and there was a horrible smell. So naturally, I started thinking it was the older guy, right? Like just, nah, I mean, this guy looks, the young guy looks normal. So I'm paired against the older guy later in the tournament. I'm like, oh God, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to report him to the arbiter for like not having <laughs> proper hygiene. I show up to the board, he smells like flowers. <laughs> so it turned out it was the younger guy who looked like totally normal guy, you know? And, and I, I let, you know, I let him, I, I tried to, I judged people by appearance and, and, I, and I shouldn't have done. The younger guy hadn't showered in probably two weeks. Yeah, appearances can be deceitful. For example, you know, take, take yourself in this case, right? You know, you're wearing a t-shirt, like a tank top, as they call it. Yeah. You know how they call those things in my country? Uh, they're called wife beaters, aren't they? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't, do you know why? Because, you know, in every single movie that is on, this, on the Polish TV, if you see a guy wearing, like, a tank top like this, in the next, in the next scene, I, I promise you, he's going to stalk his wife, you yeah? know? Like, literally, literally. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's got a very bad. It's got a very negative connotation. I know, I know. I just, um, I, I don't know. They're very comfortable, you know. I just, <laughs> if if you sweat in one of these because it's really humid and disgusting outside, okay, at least you're setting this. I don't like wearing a t-shirt because you see me sweating everywhere. It's, it's yeah. Uh, but regarding your story, once again, imagine like an alternate reality, you know, another universe where you're playing and you're one of your opponents is observing you and he's saying, oh yeah, he's certainly a wife of beater. <laughs> and he gets paired against you and he's like, oh my God, I'm going to have to report him to, to the arbiter. Yeah? And then it turns out that there was another suspect, you know, and, and this guy actually, he's the wife of beater and he's like, he's feeling bad about it. He's like, oh, I judged him, you know, by appearances. Yeah? Yep. Funny, funny actually. It makes sense. It makes makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, if you, did, if you didn't know who I was, I mean, you probably see me on the street like, man, this douchebag in his tank top, man. That's, uh... <laughs> Uh, that's a uh, that's a good note to sign off on. Um, Wojciech, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a pleasure having you, and uh, I'll let you know when the episode is out. Thank you very much. I had a lot of fun as well. As always, folks, if you made it this far in the episode, I want to say thank you for your continued support of my content. And if you'd like to catch more of the podcast, you can find it on all sorts of platforms like Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, and everything else. And if you'd like to support me beyond that, I have chess courses at GothamChess.com. Donation links on Twitch and YouTube, and I will see you right back here in Gotham City with our next guest very soon.